answering prayer requests as I've been thinking about that last 10 years and things. Um, one of the things that, that came up this week for me was, was thinking about the flooding in Texas and how easy it is for us to go, oh, that, that happened, but now we're on to something new. And, um, and then there's Vegas. And um, some, a, a pastor friend of mine sent out a note that said, pray for all the folks who um, are now having sleepless nights and trying to deal with what happened. Which isn't the people I usually pray for. We, I think we pray for people's bodies a lot, but we don't recognize the long effects of some of these things that go on, or, or Puerto Rico, um, or even the unknown effects of what it's going to look like to have a heart without John. There's, there's, um, there's long-lasting things that go on, and so I just want to pray for that, pray for this message as we get into it, and uh, we'll see where it takes us. Lord, um, you are good. You're gracious and compassionate and loving as, as we heard through the worship music and as we were reminded through the words and through the music. Um, and we pray for those who have been affected by um, the tragedies that have gone on um, in our country, in the world, and in our lives, honestly. There's a lot that's gone on in our lives that, that uh, entangles us. And so, Lord, um, now as we consider freedom, I want to especially bring those things to you. Teach us what it means to be free. Guide us through your word. Plant things in our hearts. Direct Amen. our lives. Amen. Um, yeah, this this um, particular sermon in the, in the series is on what does it look like for God to give us freedom from the past? Because the past has a funny way of, of entangling us. And, and so we're going to look at Philippians 3, 10 through 14. And it's a great text for this. So I just want to read it. I want to know Christ, yes, to know the power of his resurrection and participate in his sufferings, becoming like him in his death, and so somehow attaining to the resurrection from the dead. Not that I've already obtained all this, or I've already arrived at my goal, but I press on to take hold of that for which Christ Jesus took hold of me. Brothers and sisters, I don't consider myself yet to have taken hold of it, but here's what I do. Forgetting what is behind, straining towards what is ahead, I press on towards the goal to win the prize for which God has called me heavenward in Christ Jesus. As we were singing that, uh, that hymn that we just ended on, Be Thou My Vision, actually all the old hymns do this. The last verse is always about heaven. It's always about hope. It always points us forward where we're going and it's so great to end on that note and I kind of miss that among the praise songs they don't always have like a, a victorious ending to it um, but there's something that Christ has taken hold of us for it's where we're headed and how do we get there with the past kind of grabbing onto us how do we lay hold of that for which Christ Jesus took hold of us um, Galatians 5.1 says this, it, it, it's for freedom that Christ has set you free. Um, if you want to know why Jesus took hold of you, it's to set you free. I had that question um, very early on in my life in my ministry. Why would God invite me into his family? Why did Jesus have to die and rise again And for me? What do I have to do with all of this? Um, I have a friend who uh, got saved from her addiction, and uh, and she describes it as God plucked her out of that for a different life. That, frankly, is a much, much better life. But why would God pluck us? And we've all been plucked in different ways. Maybe it took a little longer. Maybe it didn't have some miraculous start. But there's this journey of God grabbing us, saving us, inviting us into his family. Why would God do that? He was just fine in heaven. Why would Jesus leave heaven, come to earth, die on a cross for us? Um, my first answer to that was, well, usefulness. Maybe I could be useful to God. God needed somebody to go to camp to tell little kids about Jesus so that they could be saved. And, and camp reinforced that. They said, you know what? You're here to tell kids about Jesus. And you may be the only opportunity they ever have to know God. Wow. 
I was so burdened, man. I was like, oh, I decide the difference in these kids' lives. Whether they experience life or not is all on this week, this moment in me. Um, I later found that that wasn't true, that God is quite capable of doing what he wants to do, um, which is interesting. So if it isn't because God needed me for something, why would God do this? If he didn't just need an army of robots to run around and tell people about Jesus, why would God grant us? And the answer to that I found in John 10.10. 10. A thief comes to steal, kill, and destroy, but I've come that you might have life. Life to the full. God was not okay with a thief coming and stealing and killing and destroying our lives. But he wants us to have life to the full. And how to do that was to come. So there's this absolute mind-blowing thought at the very start of this whole thing about Jesus, which is this. The God who created the universe, who is all-powerful, loves each of us so much that he would lay down his only son, that he would give his life so that we could know him and enjoy him and be loved by him and experience life. Um, growing up, I loved Christmas. Christmas was awesome. You got presents all the time and stuff. Later on, I figured out that giving presents is even more fun, but that took a while. Um, but I had grandparents who um, had some resources for sure, and they would send over like 25 presents for each kid. And my, my parents, were like barely making ends meet. My mom was working nights as a nurse, my dad was a school teacher, and so we each got one present from them, and then like 25 from grandma and grandpa. And so my parents, reasonably so, called up my grandpa and were like, you gotta stop this, you're ruining Christmas. Like the kids don't even know that we gave them anything, because they're just surrounded by all this stuff that you gave them, right? And so my grandfather heard and um, said, all right, well, would it be okay if I send maybe three presents? And they were like, well, I guess that's okay, or better yet, just send one. And he said, okay. So um, he would send some stocking stuffers, mm -hmm. and then one present. But that didn't stop my grandfather, because he would decide what was the most mind-blowing present <laughs> that he could possibly give us. So I remember like being seven, and I opened my present from my grandpa, and it was in a little box, and it said, go to the garage. <laughs> and I went to the garage, and there before me was a thing of great beauty. It was a BMX bike, my first BMX bike. It was all gold colored, <laughs> with yellow wheels, and tires that were yellow too. And I thought this was the coolest thing ever. And so I immediately, like, bailed out on Christmas from my family, rode the bike into the street, hit the brakes, looked back and realized I had left a skid of yellow on the street. <laughs> and now I had a new mission. I was going to transform the entire street yellow through just riding as fast as I could and then hitting the brakes. Blew my mind. Every year, that was Grandpa's mission. Blow the kids' minds so that they... Don't ever expect what's coming, and they know that we love them. God has that in mind for us. I want to give you life, life to the full, that's going to absolutely blow your mind. You're going to experience things that you could have never fabricated or imagined yourself, so that you know that you're loved by me. That's what God wants to do. So how do we lay hold of it? That's what Paul's getting at. How do we receive the present? How do we go, God, I want what you have for me, this, this life to the full that we can't quite wrap our heads around. And the first step is, is this. Forget what lies behind. That's what it says. Um, forget what lies behind. That is easier said than done like a lot of things in Scripture tells us to do. <laughs> um, we have a way of letting past hurts and bumps and bruises and breaks and tragedies stop us from moving forward. 
Um, do you guys know the movie Napoleon Dynamite? It's one of my favorites. It's like yeah. every bit of awkwardness in youth that could be is like encapsulated in this one movie. And um, Napoleon is just this super awkward guy, and his brother's awkward, and they're kind of outcasts through school, and their grandparent is sick, and so their uncle comes to take care of them, and he's Uncle Rico. He's one of my favorite characters. Uncle Rico is in his 40s, and he spends his time making videos of himself throwing footballs and sending it to the NFL in hopes that they'll give him a shot at the glory that he could have had. And there's this uh, time where Uncle Rico kind of explains his life, and he says, Man, if only Coach had put me in the game in the fourth quarter, we would have won state. I would have gone pro for sure. I would have made millions of dollars, and I would be, I'd be sitting in a mansion somewhere, and I'd be soaking it all up in a hot tub with my soulmate. And then he turns to uh, Kip, Napoleon's brother, and goes, Hey, Kip, you know a lot about the internet, right? Is there such a thing? time travel. And he spends the whole rest of the movie trying to find a time machine to go back so that that fourth quarter he could talk the coach into putting him in the game because he's absolutely sure that if this one thing happened, he would have had a great, great life. <coughs> that one thing, if only some fork in the road or ways back where we wish that we could go back and make an adjustment. Do you ever think about those? I do. I have those spots that I wish I could go back. Another thing uh, that, that has a way of entangling me is, is um, labels. Like, somebody said something about you and you believed it at some point, and it seemed to have stuck. I did my, uh, I was telling you that I had my church planning boot camp. Well, right before that, they gave us a personality exam. It was like hundreds of questions, and you had to fill out what you thought about them. And, and uh, they would read it all over, and, and they, they provided us the results and said, Well, Chris, you'd be pretty good at being a pastor. You are, are maybe okay for church planning, except there's one problem. You're risk averse. You don't take risks. And in church planning, really, you have to have an entrepreneurial, like high risk, uh, shoot for the stars or crash and burn sort of mentality. And, and you don't really have that. So I planted the church anyway, and it, it was running along. And then uh, after we closed that church, I was considering another one in, in West Seattle. And we were sitting there talking with a small group that was going to plant this church. And, the dialogue was on what what holds you back from doing this? What are you what are you worried about in terms of planting a church? And what I said was, well, I have a hard time taking risks. I'm I'm, I'm risk averse. <laughs> and uh, my friend Chris Holowati was in the room, and, and thankfully I had people around me who knew me pretty well. And he goes, that's not you. What are you talking about? Like he totally called me out on it. He's like. That's not even true at all. You risked starting a church in your living room, and now you're considering doing that again. It's not like you're risk averse at all. Um, I don't know who you're talking about. Um, there's a note column on our report cards. You probably got the same thing in your note column year after year, whatever was in there. Uh, mine was, doesn't live up to potential. <laughs> I don't know how they thought that was going to help me in life. <laughs> well, it was great having Chris in school, but he doesn't live up to his potential. I'm like, great. I'm smart, but I'm incapable of using it. Is that what you're saying? <laughs> um, so that was what mine always said. Really smart kid, really nice kid, but, but not living up to his potential. Um, and it stuck with me after about the third time it popped up on the report card. When I was in Arizona, I went to go see a counselor, a fantastic Christian counselor. And one of the things that she had me do was consider the tapes that were running. We talked about it like in an audio tape. All of us have audio tapes that run in our head around different situations of things that we tell ourselves. And she had me start writing down the things that I would say to myself, which is a really, really challenging thing because you're like, oh. And then we think it to ourselves, but to actually stop and write it down 
I was amazed at how rude I am to myself. <laughs> like all of us have no problem. Like we would never go up to somebody and go, you are such an idiot. You screw everything up all the time. How many of you would actually say that to another human being? Oh, yeah. How about <laughs> We have no problem saying that to ourselves, though. Ah, I'm such an idiot. I screw things up all the time. Uh, and she had me start writing these things down. And then the trouble with it is that we say it to ourselves so many times that eventually we believe it. I am an idiot. I screw things up all the time. That's, that's me. And all of this is done without listening to what Christ would have to say to us. So I ran across this passage, Lamentations. Lamentations is a dark book, by the way. I seem to like dark books. That's troublesome. I should probably talk to somebody about that. But um, Lamentations, like everything has gone wrong in Jerusalem. Like they're surrounded, they're sieged. Uh, like the place is, is turning into a disaster. And here's what Jeremiah has to say. Lamentations 3, 18. So I say, my splendor is gone. Everything that I had hoped for from the Lord. I remember my affliction and my wandering and, and the bitterness and the gall. I well remember them and my soul is downcast within me. Yet this I call to mind and therefore I have hope. So when you're thinking about all the things that have gone wrong, Here's where the hope is. Because of the Lord's great love, we are not consumed. His compassions and his mercies never fail. In fact, they're new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. And so I say to myself, the Lord is my portion. Therefore, I will wait for him. The Lord is good to those who put their hope in him, to the ones who seek him. Um, what a combination a faithful God which means he delivers again and again over and over every time and what does he deliver mercy, compassion grace every single day that means that every day is a fresh start every day could be different I used to walk into work, by the way, I used to work in an office in between church gigs, and I was the really annoying Monday morning person. He was like, oh, hi, good to see you, so glad you're here. And they hadn't had their coffee yet, and they're like, oh. Um, but I was that guy. And so I, I began walking in, and I would, I would say to myself sometimes, I'd go, you know what, today could be the best day of my life, I don't know, it's just getting started. And then I began to say that to other people. They did not like that on a Monday morning. <laughs> you know, today could be the best day of your life. You have no clue what's going to happen next. Um, but there is something to that. Today could theoretically be different than yesterday. It could be different. And yet, we let yesterday define today. And we let yesterday's stuff define us today and tomorrow. Um, even if it's not tragedy, on the other side of the coin, um, in context of um, Philippians 3, Paul is listing all the reasons why he was, he was worthy of considering to be great. He was a smart, smart kid, really good theologian. Uh, if any Jewish person had a reason to be proud, he was from a great family, he kept all the rules all the time, and he says, you know what? I want to read it for you in his words. Here's what he says. Uh, if someone else has reason to put confidence in the flesh, I have more of a reason. I was circumcised on the eighth day of the people of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew among Hebrews in regards to the law of Pharisee, as for zeal, persecuting the church, and as for righteousness based on the law, faultless. But whatever were gains for me, I now consider loss for the sake of Christ. What's more, I consider everything a loss for the surpassing worth of knowing Jesus, my Lord. Let go of the past to take hold of tomorrow. See, the trouble is, even if we look back and we go, man, I was such a great whatever. 
Like I look at, I'm thinking about John's life moving forward. He's like, man, I used to be a pastor today. That's what he's thinking. I, I used to be a pastor. But um, I got to share his post about his retirement. I'm going to pull it up here. Do you guys mind if I do that? Go right. for Cool. Do, do, do. I'm glad you said yes. That's okay. Because I was going to do it. Anyway. <laughs> um, here's what John had to say. I love it. He said, last night I officially retired. I've been an ordained pastor since 1977, so that's a lifetime. So now I can finally focus on nurturing relationships, hearing people's stories, encouraging folks to follow Jesus. My office will be Starbucks, and my pulpit will be wherever we consider what life might be like together. So I guess it's not changing much at all. I'm grateful for your friendship along the way. You see, John may think, if he looks back and looks at his successes, he'll go, man, I used to be a pastor of this great church called Harbor. <laughs> or he can go, man, who am I now? And the past informs it a little bit. John is the pastor to the not yet Christian. Look at all of his books. Christians generally are not stoked on buying his books. But the people in, like, airports or who are struggling with something, read his books and go, man, that's really good. He speaks like a therapist. What they don't know is that he's just sharing the gospel over again. Um, he's the unofficial chaplain of the golf club where he's at. Like everybody knows, if you're having a hard time, well, you go talk to him. And he's a writer who happens to be a pastor, I guess. So, um, God's going to build on that in a brand new way. But if John's focused on what he used to be, he's not going to be able to find it. And if we're focused on the past successes we've had, we're not going to see what God is doing now. God has something better. The pattern of the world is to always predict what's going to happen next with someone based on what happened before. We are people of routine. Well, most people are people of routine. Christina gets driven nuts by the fact that I'm not. But for the most part, we kind of do the same thing that we used to do. Um, the Christian story is not that. The past is actually a terrible predictor of who we will be because it assumes that God is not a part of the story. It assumes that the all-powerful, all-loving God has not moved into our lives and is working us towards something different in the future. The past is a terrible <laughs> predictor of where we're going to be. Um, this week, I have been thinking about what am I like without John as a co-pastor. And there's this terrible fear in me. Here's what it is. While I planted a church before, now I don't have John with me. What if it's the same thing all over again? And, and it doesn't work out like I think it'll work out, and I just end up replaying what happened before. And I'm forgetting some things. One... A bunch of years of ministry with John will change anybody. Um, two, I'm assuming that God's not a part of the picture. Three, I've met you, and I've walked a mile or two with you all, and that's changed me. So I don't have a chance of doing the exact same thing that I did before. Um, the past doesn't define our lives. The present is impossible to define what's going to happen next because it's just a moment. So what defines us? The future. Verse 10. I want to know Christ. I want to know the power of His resurrection. I want to participate in His sufferings, become like Him in His death, and so somehow attain to the resurrection of the dead. With God there is this incredible power that comes into our life that takes dead things and brings them back to life. It takes brokenness and sets it right. With the resurrection, absolutely everything changed. A bunch of disciples were sitting up in a room and they were terrified because Jesus had just been killed. And it is pretty hard to figure out why the next thing that happens is they're standing out on street corners yelling at the top of their lungs. People are becoming disciples and they get killed because they're so bold about sharing this news of new life. It doesn't make sense. A guy is cowering in a room. 
But then the resurrection happens and they go, oh, we don't have to be scared anymore. Jesus' body was broken. It was dead. Uh, the Romans knew how to kill someone and they had done it. But then he came back to life and his body was somehow different, changed. Um, these people who had incredible disappointment, a tragedy, the one that they'd been following had been killed, all of a sudden discovered that what they were thinking about, what they'd been following, was way bigger than they ever thought it could be. There was a new passion, a new purpose that they didn't even think was possible in all this. And God's resurrection power moved in. What if that's what God's doing with each of us in our lives? Bloody, broken stuff, go away, die, suffering losses, but then rising again in a new way, trading ashes for glory. Um, Moses, when he went and spent time with God face to face, he came back and, it's, and they said his, his face was radiant. Um, I've seen people's face radiant when they've spent time with God and they've been changed. David Crowder has this great song um, called Glorious. And, and he says an amazing line over and over again, which praise songs are really good at saying the same line over and over again until you get it. But here's what he says. Um, you make everything glorious, and I'm yours. So what does that make me? You make everything glorious. That's what God does. He brings things to life in new and abundant ways. And you do that with everything you do, and now I'm yours, so what does that make me? Guess it's on the way to glory. Glorious, step by step. So we forget what lies behind. We press on with God towards that which could be. We give other people a little bit of margin if they're walking with God to be something different as well. It's a really beautiful thing. Um, I call it the pastoral hope. Um, I ran across that term sort of when um, I was talking with a guy who just worked with really, really tragic people's lives. And I said, yeah, they do it again and again and again. Why do you keep giving them a chance? And he goes, well, pastoral hope. And it's the idea that if God gets involved in something, just about anything's possible. If somebody's on their deathbed, I will go and pray at their hospital bedroom. And why? Because with God, there's life. Maybe it'll be the life to come, or maybe he'll just miraculously heal them. I don't know. I don't get to control God, but what I do know is that God brings life. What if he does that in us? So how do we do it? We forget what lies behind we press on towards one thing, knowing Christ and knowing him more fully in our lives. And we remember day by day, this week, this month, no matter what has gone on in our lives, God's mercies are new because of his great love we are not consumed and therefore we are headed towards hope. So we invite God to walk alongside of us when we're feeling old or tired or with things that are impossible and with brokenness and when we're dealing with impossible situations and we say, God, I don't know much, but you seem to be pretty good at taking broken things and making them better. Can you do that with me too? Let's do it. Let's pray. God, um, we live in a world that reminds us of brokenness all the time. And yet, you are a God who creates new things. And so we ask, Lord, that you would disentangle us from the things that hold us back from the past, that you would let it, uh, let it inform us on where we could go, but that we have an open mind about the possibilities that you could bring. Thank you for bringing a God who does new life, who brings new life and new situations and new opportunities. May we never let the old messages of the past entangle us. God, thanks for your grace for your mercy, which is fresh and new every day, and for your great faithfulness in delivering it again and again. We love you.